Cam. We've, uh, we're now at the point where we have uh, what we like to call um, uh, the stage of where we, can, where we can explore the use of quantum computers. We call it quantum readiness. Uh, basically what that means is we have programmable quantum computers so we can start to write algorithms, experiment with those algorithms. Um, <clears throat> and we're on the cusp of what we call the phase of quantum advantage. So we're quantum computers that will actually exhibit a performance advantage compared to classical computers. The key activity or the key um, job to be done by both technology providers and customers right now is to explore how we can use quantum computing in detail. Um, theoretically, we, we know that uh, quantum computing is going to provide a significant performance advantage, but the devil is in the details. and the uh, industry and uh, our customers are all um, working on developing those algorithms, developing those use cases together with us, together with other players in the market. Um, so we're in the phase now of um, um, analogous to the, the idea of quantum readiness to a phase where we're developing intellectual property, basically, to take things to commercial usage, we need um, more qubits, and especially we need more what we call quantum volume. Um, and that will herald the onset of um, the phase of quantum advantage. Um, and that's probably going to occur in the next few years. So quantum computing is is applicable to um, problems which are which you can describe as uh, well, what we call a large state space or something you can transform a problem you can transform into solving a large state space. Typically, these are problems in from material science, chemistry, physics, pharmaceuticals, uh, problems where you're dealing with physical things. Um, we also know now that there are a whole class of problems around optimization, which are um, transformable into quantum computing representations that we can also significantly speed up. Um, there are, I mean, the classic traveling salesman uh, uh, problem is uh, um, one of them, uh, graph partitioning, um, uh, binary optimization, um, and these kinds of problems, you find them, it's, it's, you find them everywhere. Um, they're so ubiquitous and uh, pervasive in our lives um, that the, uh, the, I think the impact in that area is going to be the most significant. The, the other area where we know now, in principle, how you can use quantum computers is in certain classes of algebraic problems. and the uh, typically these these application areas will be around machine learning, artificial intelligence, and that kind of thing. And then there's a fourth area of applications, um, which is probably of most interest to your listeners and viewers, which is around the area of cryptography, um, specifically things like key di distribution, public key cryptography. Um, the timescales of when those are going to happen vary. Um, I think the material science of so physics, pharmace uh, physics, chemistry, pharmaceuticals, material science, that's where quantum advantage is going to happen first. So I, I think at least initially, and certainly with the, the technologies we have available today to implement quantum, uh, quantum computers, we will see a uh, the initial uh, usage 
through cloud access. Uh, so quantum computers working in specialized compute centers. Um, we may then also see a move towards a hybrid compute model. So where um, you may in your compute center have a, a quantum um, a quantum computer as part of a high performance computer or even as part of an enterprise computer. I think that scenario is a few years down the road, but it's certainly, uh, th certainly feasible. Um, I'm often asked, when will I have a quantum computer in my laptop or in my watch? Um, uh, I won't say, ne never say never, so I won't say it'll never happen. Um, but um, that's a few, f few years away yet. So uh, the, the primary impact at the moment of quantum computing on public key cryptography, and especially on key distribution, is still purely theoretical in the sense that we don't have quantum computers that can crack um, commercially available or commercially used um, um, encryption algorithms. Um, that doesn't mean the impact is uh, um, is not significant just because it's theoretical. So if you look at the time value of data, for example, um, particularly in the area of key distribution, then you often find applications which have a life cycle measured in decades. Um, if you imagine a point one or two decades in the future where you have a quantum computer which can break thousand bit uh, one thousand bit RSA, then that means that any anything you've done today using thousand bit RSA can be compromised in the future. Um, and to that end, the um, especially as I said, especially in the area of key distribution, the American National Institutes of Science and Technology um, have <clears throat> put together a proposal, a roadmap for standardizing uh, what they call um, uh, quantum robust or post-quantum key distribution. Um, that standardization process is in the final stages now. The last 12 months, there have been several rounds of selection of algorithms, of potential candidate algorithms. Um, we're in the last round now, and we expect that uh, approximately a year from now, NIST will uh, announce and publish their recommendations for um, for um, post-quantum key distribution um, protocols and algorithms. And IBM is very active in that area as well. So what we've, what we see um, with our customers, people who've joined the IBM Q network, um, at the moment, there are two of those who have um, basically um, said we want a full machine, a full quantum computer, so an IBM Q System 1. One of them is in Germany, Fraunhofer Institute. That machine is uh, being installed in our compute center in Einingen. So the model at the moment, and this is still for research, for joint research, the model at the moment is that that machine will be installed in IBM's compute center in in, uh, in Baden-Württemberg. Um, Fraunhofer and Fraunhofer Institutes will have exclusive and complete access to the, that machine. Um, I think that model is going to be um, a good way to move forward in the near term. Um, it may at some point become uh, feasible and relevant and commercially um, commercially um, makes sense to actually have quantum computers in your own compute center. One thing we've seen when talking about the Fraunhofer machine, one of the key, uh, key arguments, if you will, is um, actually having the ability to have compute quantum computing capacity in Europe. Um, this is uh, this is uh, we appreciate this uh, the 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 importance of this. Um, that's one of the reasons that we uh, we agreed to put the machine or bring the machine to to Europe. I think that reflects the fact that uh, ultimately people want to have 
um, sovereignty over their own data. They want to have control over their own data and own alg algorithms, understandably so. So I see a, a future where well, yeah, probably quantum computers will end up in the compute center. I think that's uh, uh, quite a few years away. Um, but the first step is uh, via the cloud. Um, and I mean, ultimately, uh, our compute models um, over the next few years will be completely virtualized. Um, they are to a large extent now, but uh, I think that transformation is is going to uh, is going to com is going to really push the virtualization of everything, um, and then it becomes uh, not so critical whether the machines actually physically on your premises, but at least under your your direct control. So it's a rather roundabout way of saying I don't I don't know. I'm sure there are situations where customers and uh, will want compute quantum computers physically on their premises but i think for the uh for the majority of uh, use cases uh, the cloud delivery model will be the the winner tech cam